This week on the Let's Talk Caving Podcast, we're talking about access control and specifically electrified openings. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions submitted by installers, estimators, project managers, ICT people, even customers. We are connecting at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this show on YouTube, would you mind hitting that subscribe button and the bell button to be notified when new content is being created? If you're listening to us on one of the audio podcast platforms, would you mind giving us a five-star rating? If we're not a five-star rating, Email me. Let me know what I need to do to make this a five-star rated show. Those simple little steps helps us take on the algorithm so we can educate, encourage, and enrich the lives of people in this industry. Furthermore, while this show is free and it will always remain free, if you find value in this content and you would like to support it, make sure you click on the QR code right there. You can buy me a cup of tea. You can schedule a 15-minute one-on-one Zoom call with me, after hours, of course. Or you can just make a donation to the show to help offset some of the costs of the show. Thursday nights, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What are you doing? I do a live stream on YouTube, TikTok, LinkedIn, Instagram, a bunch of other places where you get to ask your favorite RCDD, of course that's going to be me, your favorite questions about design, installation, certification, and even career path questions. But I can hear you now, but Chuck, I'm driving my truck at 6 p.m. I don't want to get into an accident. That's okay. I record them, and they're available at letstalkcabling.com. Also, make sure you share it with somebody who might find some interest in this as well. You know, a lot of people lump low-voltage contractor work, and they think it's just voice and data cabling. Low voltage expands well beyond those borders. There's also access control, building automation, all kinds of other stuff. And there's unique challenges with each type of work, because not everybody gets to work in a drop tile ceiling environment, drop a cable down a hollow wall. Today, we're focusing on access control and electrified openings, because while I consider myself a really good person when it comes to fishing walls, I don't know how well I would be fishing a door frame, but you know, I've got something that might help you with this. So I'm bringing in today some subject matter experts on how to make this easier than the folks from FrameFrog. Hello, Gary. Hello, Ron. How are you guys doing? Good, Chuck. How are you? Glad to have you on the show. Uh, why don't you guys... Thank you. Why don't you guys give us, uh, you know, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 second uh, introduction, who you are, your expertise, what certifications you may have. I'm Ron Hicks, and... Um, my background is in architecture. I'm a, I'm a licensed architect, been an architect for over 40 years. And uh, when, about midway in my career, I joined a large firm in Cincinnati. And within two years, I took over to the supervision of our field service group. And that involves my colleague here to my right, Gary Johnson, who was one of the field reps on our project. So in, to finish me up, um, I basically managed the field service group for about 20 years which is where all the fun is, where all the uh, problems explode on uh, projects and you have to get involved in trying to solve those problems. And Gary was the initiator of bringing this problem to our attention at the firm. Basically, I was a carpenter uh, and evolved into a construction superintendent, did that for about 25 years, came to Steedham and Paul for their with their field service group and uh, we're out there trying to make things work. Uh, and it's my responsibility to see it all does when we leave. And about 20 years ago, I got my first uh, access control job, was a 300,000 foot school with 600 doors and 58 of them were electrified. And I figure if I get everybody in the trailer that's supposed to know what they're doing and give them their marching orders and everything should be fine. And it wasn't. Uh, it was terrible, actually, and uh, didn't make many friends throughout that. And we went on to the next job and the next job. We refined the way we were doing things. We thought we had it figured out, but we still couldn't get people to do it the way 
we intended. And we have actually, we think we've thought of every possibility. And uh, our, our product that we're, we're working with, you'll see here today, is the culmination of all that effort. Probably about 20 years of focusing on this issue and uh, felt like we finally came up with a solution about four years ago. You know, I was just thinking as you guys were introducing yourself, you know, I've been in the industry for four decades and I've, I've been, I've been an installer, project manager, all that stuff. And I've dealt with architects and stuff like that. And I, I always think about the disconnect between the installation side of it and the architect side of it. So Gary, do you have to educate Ron every now and then? Uh, I, well, on a constant daily basis. Every usually. day. You see, you see this flat head here? It used to be pointy. It was a pointy head, yes. And gotcha, uh, gotcha. We've seen that down, and he's a regular guy now. Nice. He's almost almost, a, almost a field person now, huh? That's right. Almost. Yes. Not yes. quite. I, I said almost. Almost. I said almost. He still wears his loafers out, but, you know. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? you you got to wear appropriate people. Yeah, that, that's an architect for you. Yeah. Gary, Gary's from Indiana. I'm from Ohio. He's, he goes, you damn fuck guys. <laughs> oh, well, there's, there, yeah, there's another, there's another rub between you two. Yes. Holy, yeah. I, I bet working there is fun. I mean, it I is fun. We, we've, we could not be more different and we've become the best of friends. True. Thank you for saying that because, you know, I say that all the time. I actually just did a TikTok video uh last week where it was a staged video obviously but uh where some iron guys cut through a bundle of, of low voltage cabling i saw yes, that it was, a, <laughs> it, saw it was a staged video i'm pretty sure it was staged video and it, and that's kind of stuff does happen but if we all just kind of work with each other you know the electricians the iron guys the hvac man the job's gonna go so much smoother so much I, smoother well, i bought it i thought it was the real deal and oh i i could see it happening uh, absolutely sure. Yeah. Oh, it does happen. Absolutely. I, I said in the comments that I, I'm pretty sure that it was staged. Yeah. Um, but it, it but it, it highlights something that does happen. That's why that's why I posted the video. And that yeah. thing that thing took off. It's got multiple thousands of views. I can it's, yeah. I wow. can't believe how much it took off. Oh yeah. Yeah. So since I've got the guy who actually does the work and the guy who designs the work. How do, how is access control cabling different from doing like a traditional voice and data network? Um, well, it's, again, we're not cable experts. I mean, they're, and uh, back when Gary was starting this, it was most, it was all just low voltage wiring, but now we have power over ethernet. So you can run, be, be running cat five, cat six into a door frame. Um, so they can be different or they can be the exact same cable. Um, it depends upon the hardware that you've got on your frame as to how it's how it's driven. All all the safeguards that you guys build into your cabling out into the building about sweeps and all that stuff, none of that happens inside of a door frame. Right. None of it. I mean, the, the problems that you have with six months down the road when a door stops operating or a, an opening isn't working anymore is usually because of the inertia of the door shutting and you've crammed it in there and now it's metal against metal and pretty soon you expose that wire and it fails. And you would never put up with that in your data room or above the ceiling. I mean, things happen, you can get me wrong. Uh, a hammer blow in the wrong place can mess you up pretty bad, you know, but I mean, it's, it's inside that door frame or inside that, uh, that system, it it just isn't a nice place. It's jagged. It's rough. It's and and this is a way to clean all that up. Chuck, one of the I, I, I suspect you're familiar, at least to a certain degree, with construction specifications and specifications the CSI format. Yep. And if you're with that, yeah, exactly. So. Um, we have divisions and then we have spec sections in each division. And those divisions to me have always been folders. They're like, the, this is the folder for that spec, all these specs. But it's come to my realization through this effort that they're really, that the word division means exactly what it says. It's a division. And the construction industry does not like to cross between one division and the next. 
So mm -hmm. technology guys don't typically deal with hollow metal frames and hollow metal frame guys don't seem to care about network cabling. It's like somebody else's problem. And yet where these things come together, somebody has to, to cross that division. And we've taken that on as an architectural firm because our client is staring at us and going, how are you going to make this mess work when it doesn't? And so now we have to get the contractors to understand somebody's got to cross across that division and right. you know bridge between different totally different industries of the work so to address uh gary's comments about the minimum bend radiuses and stuff like that those are put in place because we're dumping huge amounts of data across that cable right not just not just obviously it is current but huge amounts of data and we're operating at high frequencies now correct me if i'm wrong i mean you're really just powering on and powering off to, to activate a device so not a lot you're not doing bandwidth you're just doing current so theoretically those bend radiuses for, for an electrified opening aren't as critical okay that and i i understand that although it's it's i mean I'm, i hear you now and i didn't understand that before but um it still doesn't address the issue of these cables being protected for one oh, in, a, in a stud wall and right now the technology is generally just power, but as we move along and progress, the notion of getting extracting data from what's happening in an opening is becoming more and more uh, uh, likely and commonplace. Right. So right. I think that uh, um, there's a lot of opportunity to um, extract the data of what's what's happening with an opening, how how many times it opens. Uh, collecting all that data, and then the, not, not even to mention the whole issue around video cameras, you know, A phones, which need, have a video stream, which um, I, don't, I think it's A phone makes an, a, a relatively new product where their A phone is only two inches wide, uh, four inches, five inches tall, and it sits right on the face of the door frame. So you're now running a video feed through that, through that hollow metal frame. In a, historically, a door and its frame and its hinges were basically the, and the lock were the, the only moving parts. And we're kind of looking at uh, this now that these openings have become sophisticated machines that do a lot of things. And will likely do more in the future. That's, that's the whole industry in a whole. I mean, just when you look at the telephones, you know, 40 years ago, we just had, pots plain old telephones or analog phone lines now you got you know you got voip telephone systems and all kinds of other stuff and, and all right we're getting some really interesting and cool stuff power over ethernet building automation stuff i mean just there's a lot of cool stuff coming down the pike really and i don't so, know if this, i don't know if this is likely or not chuck you would know better than i but i mean is it possible that it, at some point there might be fiber being run to door frames i don't know but it, I guess it's uh, well, you need you need current to activate it, right? Yeah. So, if you have fiber running to the door frame, you would have to have some kind of a copper carrying conductor for the current. And I don't know if there's ever going to be enough information exchanged between a an electrified opening that's going to require the bandwidth that fiber brings to bear. Okay. You know, okay. you know, I mean, a category six A cable can do ten gig. 10 gig that's a ton of energy a ton of, of bandwidth okay. um I, I really don't think i don't think like hey watch me be proven wrong in five ten years down the road right uh, or it right maybe now? it's some new technology that we haven't even none of us has ever seen that happens in five years and explodes into the world right 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 so they uh they they, they scan your retina and then while they're scanning your retina they do a dna check to make sure you are who you are and take and, your temperature Take your temperature and see if uh, if you have any uh, genetic defects, or you might want to not have kids. And who knows what's coming down the pipe? <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Yes, exactly. And right. so, the, to our point is, I think people need to re, be rethinking the need for a pathway to an opening that currently you may not need a pathway for, but. These buildings are built to, you know, schools, which is what we do, are built to serve for 50 to 75 years. And who's to say that you may not need wire into that doorframe two years, five years, 10 years from now? 
how many times, I can't tell you how many times our owners come to us as the building is opening up. It's ready to open and they can, can I get a card reader on that door? It's a little late now. <laughs> Typically what we do with, uh, with all the hollow metal frames, the exterior doors at the very least will have a contact to tell you that it's closed and shut and latched so you can arm the building. And what we were doing, we were putting uh, three boxes in it. So just for that occasion, that when it comes down to it, the owner comes to you and say, you know, I'd like to have a card reader on that electric room on the back of the building. Sure, we can do that. You know, or I'd like to have an electric electric lock on that door that right. we never planned on. You know, so we, we ended up outfitting the outside doors and uh, maybe the data rooms. Uh, if you got some really important uh, documents and things that you want, you know, secured, then those were the doors that we planned on. And then an owner would look at it and say, I'd like to have a card reader on this because I got a school next door and my teachers are traveling back and forth. And uh, so uh, there's always some, some additional things before it's over with. And that's what we tried to plan for. And then now we're seeing school districts look at it like, I may want to lock this whole place down. I want to, may want to lock the, the classroom doors. So maybe they don't have the funds to do all of this at the time, but for a very reasonable and low price, they can put the infrastructure in so they can always go back and do it and not have to get back inside the wall. So two things. First, Ron, thank you for saying that the average life of a building is 50 to 75 years. Because I've been saying that for a long time. I don't know where I got those numbers from, but I've been saying it for a long time. You'd be surprised at how many people argue with me over that. Oh, well. No, it's that's that's, a, that's an industry accepted number. I, did, I didn't. I, I obviously learned it somewhere. I, it's not like yeah, I'm, I think, I'm not an architect. I don't. Most, I most that. designers would. Pro, that, that's a higher number on what I think most designers would suggest is what their designs are. But the fact of the matter is, they don't come down in 50 years. They they just refurbish them. They regenerate them. They, right. Right. They're not. They're. There's how many buildings are 100, 120 years old running around here, or exactly. or older. Yeah. Exactly. So let me ask you this, and this is not one of our list of questions. This is the architect question, right? So you said the average life of, of school buildings, 50 to 75 years. Is that number true for a commercial office building or is that a different number that the architect world uses? I, I would say that's a, a totally different number for, I mean, the building, the structure itself may be 50 years, but the number of times that that building is going to undergo alteration, just partitioning, interior partitioning, that, that that could happen every couple of years, especially if it's a government. <laughs> so since we're talking about electrified openings, well, first off, what is an electrified opening? You want to take that or you want me to? Well, I, in my opinion is, uh, is that anything with a wire to it is an electrified opening. And therefore you're talking contacts, you're talking electric strikes, uh, EPTs to get wire back into the door itself for locks or uh, electrified panic hardware. And as Ron mentioned a while ago, that we are seeing some uh, uh, camera type things. And there, it's uh, anything that's got wire to it should be prepared for any of its inevitabilities, I would think. And I mean, you don't have to, but I mean, help yourself yep. while you're building the building. Right. I mean, and there, there is, there's always wireless hardware, which doesn't really require a pathway, but that is typically, in my opinion, a cheaper solution. And it's done because you don't want to tear into the frame and remove the frame. Uh, but if you're doing new build, um, my understanding is the federal government won't even talk about wireless. It has to be wired. And I think it's more reliable. Um, it's certainly it's, a maintenance issue. Yeah. The, the maintenance of wireless and battery powered devices is right. can be quite a headache. So, uh, you know, we've, we've ripped our, you know, big believers in the wired solution. I, I don't think wireless would be a viable option 
if you need current to activate a magnet or something. Wireless would be good yeah. for setting off an alarm. You know, if somebody opens a door, doesn't open a door. Again, not for the government. And I, I tell people all the time, wireless has its place, but you know, that's another argument social media loves to get into. You know, we talk about cabling. Just go wireless. Wireless is not the answer for everything. You not know, even close. Not yes, yeah, not even close. Thank you for pointing out. And and Gary, you said it. I'm the acronym king. I, I do the acronym challenge on my LinkedIn page every day. You said an acronym I'm not familiar with. EPT. What the heck is that? Electric power transfer. We should. Okay. We should and what that does that do? Next ones. There you go. We're going to show you. We can show you that on our door frame, Chuck. Okay. Uh, electric power transfer is the hardware device that jumps a wire from the frame into the door. You can do it, you can get power into a door two ways, an EPT or an electric hinge. Got Either it. one See, works. The EPT See, four, we four decades, four decades in this industry, I'm still learning new stuff. You're, you're not a, you're not an opening access control no. guy, evidently. And and we're and we're just we're just now starting to tip our toe into your whole industry. Right. We don't yeah, that's true. We I, I don't know hardly any of your acronyms. Right. right. <laughs> well, then you should follow my LinkedIn thing. I do an acronym challenge every weekday morning. I, 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 see, it. I morning. see it. Yes. And then I put the and answers again, out on Saturdays. Illustration of the divisions that everybody lives in their own little silo of construction. Yes. And I mean, electricians will say we don't do low voltage, or you know, you know. And I mean, it's just like it, it's like taboo for some of, some of them. And if I hear it's not my job. Like one more time, uh, I don't know. It's uh, I'm prone to violence. I, I think I think you just wrote my next meme for me. It's not my job. Yeah, <laughs> you did. You wrote my next meme. Through, you know. Right. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. So we now that we know what electrified opening is, what special kind of planning tips should somebody know? you know, before they actually go out the cable, make their job a little bit easier. Okay. Wow. That is a big can of worms. And uh, um, I don't even know where, I'm not sure I know where to begin. I mean, the, we, we believe that the architect needs to kind of become the leader and the facilitator of bringing all this together. Architects are uh, good at collaboration, but they're not, experts in virtually anything. I mean, even even building code requirements have gotten so complicated that often they're hiring their own building code consultant to help them navigate the complexities of a ever evolving and more com complex building code requirements on buildings. And they never put together a hardware schedule. They get a hardware manufacturer to do that. Right, right. And, and the whole thing is it has to all work Nobody's done until everybody's done. And I think that is, is the, the lesson here that needs to be taken. But if, like I said, it's not my job. That's, that's, I, you know, I didn't put that in my bid and, and all this stuff. And this is, this is a thing that falls between disciplines. I mean, if you look at who benefits from this, who are the customers, they're the owner to begin with for because it's his building. He understands probably nothing about it, how it works or, you know, just as long as it does work. You've got architects and engineers that uh, need to know enough to be able to speak to this, to, to convince them that they need to go this direction or that direction to get it. And then you have uh, the hardware guys. They probably know more about the whole system than anybody because they've met with the owner and know what his needs are. They know the devices that need to be right. used, need you to know. be done. But again, I mean, if you you can go to any YouTube thing and it show you how to put an electric strike in. And when you look at it, one second, there's no wire. And then the next second, there's a wire there. How the heck did that happen? Right. Nobody, nobody shows you that. YouTube right. can be a great resource. Absolutely can be a great resource. I've, you know, I, I have a, I have a farm. I got an F-350 pickup truck because I'm always hauling something or another. It's a power stroke diesel. I'm, I'm, I'm good with gas. I've never had diesel before. Something happened to my truck about six months ago. I didn't even have an idea how to fix it. I hopped on YouTube, watched one video, and had my truck fixed in five minutes. Boom, running. But the problem with YouTube is you got to evaluate where that resource is, right? 
Now, the video that I watched came from a, an established YouTube channel on Power Strokes, right? I don't remember the exact name of it, but so I trusted him. If, it, if I had come across, you know, Terry's Taco channel and you happen to make a video about a Power Stroke, yeah, it might not be a good resource, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you got to evaluate your resource when, you use, when you're using YouTube. And so we were talking about door frames and stuff. And I mentioned in the intro, I don't know if you guys heard that. I'm really good at fishing walls. Absolutely. I've done it for years. I've insulated double drywall, you know, even furring ships off a block wall. Dude, I can get end on anything. And, I, and I've seen people pull that off and I'm, I, I, you know, in existing construction. And I'm like, how the hell are you going to get a wire through there? And you Magic. guys have got a lot of tricks. Magic. Your, yeah. Magic. Don't, There's don't, a lot don't, of don't, different don't, ways you guys can do it. Yeah. Don't talk to the guy behind the curtain. It's all right. Bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Be the chain trick, right? You've used that. Right. And, and one of my best friends has uh, he has his own uh, alarm company where he goes out and puts in uh, alarm cabling for he spends he he does um, residential. He doesn't do commercial buildings, and and I've watched him fish like door frames and 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 wall frames. I'm like. That's magic to me, right? I mean, how, how are you going to get a cable down that door frame, right? Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that for a minute because that's that's where I see the okay. biggest biggest thing. So, um, and back to your previous question a little bit. So, like I say, we believe the architects need to be the ones that kind of lead the charge and bring this all together. But there's a lot of other players in this thing. There's the as we've talked about. There's the hardware consultant and the uh, you may have a, a security consultant that's involved in helping to to strategize on how we're going to create a, a, a secure envelope on this building. Um, your owner needs to be involved because they're going to be the ones that are making the decisions as to, you know, who's, you know, what do I want? What do I not want? Exactly. What, what can they afford? Exactly. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a whole host of people um, that need to be involved and, if somebody needs to bring them together, and we believe the architect is the one that needs to do it. Problem is the architects, when we, when we the, the project Gary talked about back 20 years ago was a uh, reaction to the, to the Columbine shooting of 1999. So all of a sudden in 2020, we have our clients saying, I want access control on my school. And the architects did what they knew. They said, yeah, we'll get the hardware guy to specify the hardware. That's and that was that, actually. Yeah. Well, 2002 is when that project <laughs> went out. Yeah. yeah. And, but that was as far as anybody thought about it. The rest of it is a construction problem. And they'll when, figure it out. When, when, you, when you have a, when you decide you're going to figure it out on the job site, it's usually an argument and there's usually money that has to be spent in order to fill the gap. This was in the days of five primes that we had in Ohio was involved. Yeah. And so nobody had to get along. Right. I mean, if they did get along, it, it was great. Are you familiar with that term, five primes, Chuck? No, I know. I've never heard five primes. Before. Okay. So back be, be in public, in publicly funded buildings back in those days, you could not hire a single general contractor to build your entire building. You had to hire a separate general and a separate electrician, a separate plumber, a separate HVAC guy, separate sprinkler guy. And even back then, a, a separate elevator contractor. So that was the way we bid our work. And so you, the owner had five contracts or six contracts with six different companies that are all building one building. And they got to all figure out how to get along. And he was the one trying to make that happen. Right. But each one of them, their attitude, once I'm on the job site, I got this job because I was low bid and everybody else is in my way. You know, I, 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 that's how the majority of new construction works for um, for us. I, I didn't I didn't know they called that five primes. What happens is a lot of time is a, an architectural firm or maybe a GC would submit out bids to several GCs. The GCs would grab those bids, and then they would because because the GC doesn't do everything. They get a price from the electricians, a price from HVAC, a price from the sprinkler guys, a price from the electricians. And then they'd say, here's the price to do the job. And then they would manage those contractors. We as low voltage, or at least especially for voice and data, maybe not necessarily for access control. I'm not sure because I've done much of that. But voice and data, we generally work for the customer, not the GC. 
Exactly. And that always and creates a problem. That is a major part of this because what happens is because you guys are so late to the to the game, you're you show up when the building's almost done. Right. And nobody's thought about you. Nobody, nobody cares, cares, no, nobody about, cares you. about you, Chuck. Nobody loves you. <laughs> I got thick skin. I know I've known that for years. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we believe that we're your best friend because we are thinking about you and we want to pave the way to make your life as easy as possible. Because if you can't get out of there, then the owner's not happy and we can't get out of there. (laughs) Exactly right. Exactly right. So you guys came up with a really cool device. Uh, It's called the, the frame frog. Right. Okay. The frame frog. So even anybody, a brand spanking new newbie, can fish a door frame now, right? Yes, exactly. Right. We've so had, we've had I guess this, this is where the architect comes in because there's got to be some prior planning to this, doesn't there? Yes, there does. It has to be specified. It has to. It either has to be specified or somebody needs to buy it before it gets before the building's built, before the walls are closed up. This is not for retrofit. If you're doing a retrofit. It gets much more complicated. You're probably tearing out drywall. If you're doing retrofit in a concrete block wall, then you really, there's only one way to do it. And it's really not fully concealed. You're talking about running a piece of wire mold down from the top of the, from the ceiling down to the top of the frame. You can then put your completed pathway in the frame, but um, you're still going to have a piece of wire mold and you're going to have to buy a new frame because you're going to be tearing out the old frame that's in that block wall. So it, so, it's, so, so walk ahead. me through if let's say I'm a building owner and I, I and I want to put some you know electrified openings so my doors for security and stuff like that and you got me you got me convinced I want to use this frame frog because my my access control guy say it'll, the price will be go will go down some because I've got pathway. Walk me through the process. How does this whole system work? Okay. So up until you know, before we got involved in this, I mean, most, and I'm sure you've run into this, most projects, there's no accounting for any kind of a pathway in a hollow metal frame. But if you had a actual pathway in your hollow metal frame, it's going to be a, it's likely going to be a metal box. It's going to look just like this. It's going to be a, it's going to have a couple of holes for connectors that go on the end of it. And this box is going to be welded into your door frame. The problem with this solution is one is a lot of the shops, metal shops think that this is free because they make it out of scrap, but that doesn't make it free. They're still making this thing. Somebody's still got to somebody still got to put these connectors on here. This is laborious. And then you got to run a conduit around the frame. So, and the problem with this, this box is that you're usually fishing through a small hole in the frame right here trying to hit a connector that's way up inside that frame that you can't see. So if you can get lucky enough to hit that port, you don't know which port you're in. You just know you're, you're going through something where, and so what we did is we came up with a totally different design. And this is the cross sectional view of our original model. And what we did is we decided to make those ports integral to the box. So now you don't need to attach anything to our box. You basically have caps that cover these holes and you pop off the cap that you want to remove when you're trying to connect. Exactly. Yes. The other caps, you leave the caps on except for the ones that that you're going to add a conduit to. But the unique thing about this is a couple of features. One, it's all funnels. You can see here, everything funnels right into one port or the other. And the inside diameter of this conduit matches up exactly to the inside diameter of the port that's feeding into it. So there's not even a bump here. You It just slides right in. And both of these ports are funnels divided by this little divider wall right here. So what happens is when this thing's sitting in a frame, like this is, this is on a door jam, and you shove a fish tape in here, if I lean that fish tape, we'll do this on a full frame demonstration as well, but if I lean this fish tape to the right, it hits this the, this funnel and slides right in. You cannot dead end that fish tape. If I want to go to this side, I just lean it to the left and it goes right in this way. And you just it, it's literally you can literally steer your fish tape 
through this box and hit that conduit every single time. Then the other thing about this box, so you see this little belly right here. So sometimes you know, like if this box is in the head of a frame and I want to fish through this box and carry on, like maybe to go up above ceiling. So we tell you how to connect the, the, the ports, the short port, this is a long port, this is a short port. We have two models. The other one is a smaller model, but it still has a short port and a long port. And we tell you the short ports are how you connect boxes within the frame. You never touch these until you get on the job site and attach to take a conduit away from the frame and up to above ceiling. So you tie your boxes together with the short ports. These are for going above ceiling. So now as I'm going around the frame and I hit this port, this little belly here forces the fish tape across and over to this port over here. So whether I'm coming in here or I'm coming in here, it doesn't matter. I know I'm going to hit this port. And that's important because you want to know where you're going as you're fishing through because you can't see anything. Once this is all installed in the wall, everything's swallowed up. This is all invisible. But because now we have a controlled method of running that fish tape through this box, I know where I'm going at all times. If I want to come back in here to go around the frame, all I got to do is stick my finger in that frame, push that fish tape this way. There we go. Push that fish tape a little bit above this little wall right here, tuck it right behind here, and it'll carry on. And again, we'll do this in a full frame demonstration as right. well. It's very, very seamless. So that's, that's those, the features of this. Those who are listening on the podcast, you don't see what we're demonstrating. So you might want to go to the YouTube channel and, and watch this because this thing's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I got some pictures. Uh, I'm going to pull them. But you, can you just describe what we're looking at on the picture? Let's do the first one there. What's this? Okay. So that that is a, a shot of two boxes on a double, uh, a double door. It's got a center mullion. Uh, actually, I don't even think it does have a center mullion. It's just a pair of, pair of doors, and those are door position switches at the head of the frame. And um, there, you can see the boxes are welded into the frame. We we like the welding installation at a hollow metal shop. We think that's where these boxes should be installed, although we also have a field installation option that uses uh, wing tabs that we can show you as well. Um, but it, because this is being installed in the shop, uh, those two boxes swallow up two separate door position switches, and we have two conduits that connect those. So no matter which side you, uh, whatever, whichever side your your fish tape comes into, you know you can get to the other box as well. You know, Jack, when, it's also you know, DPS if you want a door position switch. What did I say? If you want, well, you did, but oh. he's got the Ackerman game. Oh, okay. I do. I do. Um, so when you when you first told me that they weld this to the door, and then when you shipped me the sample to look at, I was like, "This is plastic. You, yes. you don't weld plastic." But then I realized it had these little metal things that come with it. Right. So that's what you weld to the door, and this kind of holds that in place, right? Exactly. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. All right. So what is this picture here? Again, that that's that same frame now. A uh, little you're a little further back, but you now see the box on the jam side. And on that particular door, you can see on the far side of that frame, that big opening, that is for your EPT, your electric power transfer. So this particular door is going to have uh, an electrified lock on one or both leaves. I'm not sure, but we can now have power to either one of those doors that can go to a lock that's on that door that is fed through that EPT. And so that's the far the far side, you see the hole on the inside of the frame and on the nearer side here, you see the box, the same box on, on behind that hole. So it's a mirror image of each other. Gotcha. It could also be an electric uh, latch retracted panic hardware. Right. Gotcha. And this is just, uh, I guess, uh, some door frames that already have them already installed. So obviously this is, this is going to be more beneficial to have these things installed before the construction. Now that's where that's where the architect comes in and all the coordinating you were talking about earlier. The, right? court, the architect, the construction manager, everybody has to be on board with this. The hollow metal supplier, yeah. Um, 
and again, it can be done in the field. Like let's say, uh, you know, and we've had some uh, projects where they've discovered at the last minute that the frame didn't have any pathway to it. They want to put an electric lock, but they don't have a pathway and they've bought our box, but they're using the wing tab feature, which allows you to connect it. If you I think you've got it on the back of your, your back of your table there, Chuck, with those plastic wing tabs, those, those plastic flappers. Oh, yeah. These, these yeah. things? Yes. <laughs> those things. I was wondering what those were. <laughs> yes. Those are used for field installation. Now you would break that all off except the first one in a five and three quarter frame. And the reason it's longer, it'll go up to what? So five this, and three quarter. So this is this is a small model. It's sitting in a frame. And that little, if you don't, if you want to install this in the field, you don't want to bring a welder out to the field. So you use that little wing tab and it it attaches to this hinge hole and then it just reaches across. And when you turn that screw, it locks itself behind the hem of this frame. But that that wing tab is a lot longer because a lot of times frames are a lot deeper. Different so sizes. You, right. you need a longer you need a longer wing tab, and you just break off what you don't need. Gotcha. All right, the last picture I want to kind of look at is this picture here, and I guess okay. this picture here is showing us the benefit. I, I like the fact that this shows the completed unit. So you see the yes. the frame frog at the top, the frame frog down there by the uh, the EPT. Did I get that right? No. Um, yes. Well, uh, which one? Which slide are you looking at? The one on the picture on the right, the completed unit you know, with the frame frogs. Uh, that one. That's that's a smaller box, so that would be for an electric strike. The EPT is on the other side of that frame. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And so the picture but, on the left is just showing, uh, I guess, just the potential hazards if you don't use the a system this like is, this. Well, both both all of those are supposedly ready to ship out to a job and you can see that ours is fully contained within the frame there's nothing sticking out past the frame so you can stack them slide them lean them against the wall whatever the other pictures are uh, uh defects yeah well they will be because the ones on the left are defects or, or potential problems and they just they just you know they just don't hold up well, you can see the the center picture, the bottom red red stop sign. Uh -huh. That is a piece of conduit that's attached to a uh, back box, but it's broken. There's a connector there, but the connector snapped off and is now dropped down into that box, and somebody's going to need to fix that thing because it, and the reason that it's broken is because it was hanging off of the frame and not tied to anything like ours is. Ours is all, again, self-contained. You can see um, the conduits at the top, on the upper side of that same frame. That, 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 those are two different frames in the same shot. And those two conduits are just hanging there and nothing is supporting that. And the one on the right, the connector broke and it dropped down inside. And then the, the shot on the left, there was nothing provided on that box. And so now you have the electrician trying to figure something out in the field, and he's using a uh, braided, jacketed um, flex cable, flex right? cable that may or may not get the job done. But that's not an easy thing to fish a fish tape through. Um, you got all that friction because of the braids, and you know if that thing is installed in the wall and it's looped in a knot, you're never going to get a fish tape through there. They, if you, if you don't keep up with it, they they don't get above ceiling. Uh, we were at a job a month or two ago, and the guy said, I've spent hours. He said, the thing's lost inside the wall. I can't find it. We're out on the tailgate with our little demonstration frame, and the guy calls his office. He this said, is a low-voltage guy. Yeah. He says, he calls his office. He said, a second grader could do this. I don't know why nice. we're doing this every time. I, I can tell you right now, I've fished. I fished hollow walls. I fished insulated walls. I fished conduit. I fished BX. I would much rather fish through a smooth wall conduit than that BX that you showed on those pictures. On the every left. time we digging. showed, every time we show what we want to do, the first words that come out of somebody's mouth are, "Can I use flex? Can I use Smurf too? Can I use this? Can I use Seal that?" We, yeah, they all want to do what they want to do, and we're like, "No, do what we want you to do." <laughs> We've tried all this. That don't get me wrong. I mean, if somebody's got a better idea, I'd be happy to hear it. But they don't so far. 
I understand you guys have a demo. You can show us just how yeah. easy it is to fish this. I'm going to be doing this kind of backwards because I want you to be able to see what we're doing. But what we have here is a frame with three preps in it. I have an electric strike prep over here, which you can see now with a box behind it. I have the EPT that we've talked about over here with a box behind it. And then I also have another box at the head over here for um, a door position switch. And so those pictures that you saw from the job site have the same setup. We have three boxes that are tied together with um, conduit that, and all that can be done at the shop and it all remains swallowed up in the throat of the frame. Nothing's hanging off. You can lay them on their sides, lay them on their top and you're not gonna damage any of this. These, these are the electrician. Right tie-ins yep, that would be for a card reader this one would be headed above ceiling right so this is this is all done in the field the, the electrician shows up after the frame is stood up he pops off whatever cap he wants to tie into doesn't matter which one because once you're in the system it's a it's an entirely loop system but he can connect wherever he wants and take it above ceiling but that's what this one is here over here and then if this happened to have a card reader we would use this one and jump out there. So now, now that I've got this fully looped, I'm going to demonstrate how the fish, to, how easy it is to fish this thing right from the frame, which again, I don't know how a lot of you got your guys do it, but I suspect a lot of them have to go up, up on the ceiling and fish down to the frame because um, um, a lot of the stuff you can't, if, if you have a small hole, like for an electric hinge, you just have a small hole. You can't really fish fish in there with these with these metal boxes, and so they're probably coming down and then using a coat hanger to pull that out of that box. And they're probably three different runs. So when they're above ceiling, they don't know which one they're going to be getting into that's, until that's, they push it out. That's the other thing that we're doing is we're show we're having a completed loop so that all this can be tied together with one run that runs above ceiling as opposed to three, like Gary said, three separate home runs. So basically, I got this box here. I'm going to fish on the on the strike side, and if I lean this fish tape to the right, and I just push it in, it's going to pop right out over here at the card reader. That's easy. I'm going to lean this to the back, and now I'm going to go into the conduit that's coming up around this frame, and it's going to go through this box up here at the head. But I'm just going to keep on pushing because I know where I'm going. And it's going to go across that box, and now it's already popped out of the ceiling. So a, a, a volt, low voltage contractor can come in here and he can fish. I've fished this frame on a job site 10 feet up into the air and 15 feet across the ceiling into the next room and had that fish tape just drop down on the ground. So you can pull all your wire to the frame as opposed, opposed to pulling the wire into the frame and up across the ceiling. So you know, I don't know that you need to need to be on a ladder to do this do this wiring anymore. Um, so now, let's say I want to go from here and I want to come across and down to this box. All I do is back it up until I get to this box, and I demonstrated that before earlier. I pull this back to where I can now tuck it behind that little divider wall, and now I'm on the other side of that box. Now I'm going to come over here. And it's that simple. That is pretty slick. We're pretty excited about it. You should be. That's that. That's a that's a huge time saver. It's going to take some pre-planning, I I would imagine. But as I guess we talked about, it's going to take it's, it. It takes a lot of it, it takes a long time to get the word out to people to understand it. This is right. everybody's going a mile a minute, doing their own thing, and they're we're figuring it out on the job site. We're figuring something out, and they're on to the next job. This, I believe this will save a lot of time. for Absolutely. Time. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. So if somebody wanted more information on this, uh, on this system, how, who would, who should they contact? Should they contact you? Where are you guys located? What numbers? Well, emails? We, we have been, we have been in distribution for a couple of years on the hollow metal industry side. We're just now entering the, um, your, your industry, the ICT industry. And so, uh, we have, uh, a product uh, uh, we have a manufacturer's rep that covers about a five state area in ohio kentucky indiana um it's pc telecom is the name of that company 
but that's about it. It's only about five or six states. We're still looking for other representation. So anything outside outside of those five or six states, contact me direct. We'll get you we'll get you hooked up. And uh, as we move forward, looking for more manufacturers reps that we can that will help us get the word out. Okay, I'll put your contact Thanks. information in the comments down below. So yeah, uh, so I'm assuming the email that you and I've been communicating through is, is the email. Actually not. We've just updated that to a brand new email. I'll send it to you. It's okay. basically called, it's basically ron at framefrog.us. Okay. Perfect. Very simple. Yep. The website Perfect. is framefrog.us. The website is www.framefrog.us. Perfect. What do you want me to do with these frame frogs that you sent me for the show for demos? You want me to send them back or yeah. should I give them to yeah. some contract? Them to everybody. Yes. So yeah, spread the word. All righty. You I can, can hang on to those. Keep them. Keep them on your table there for the rest of your your uh, your um, podcast. Well, well, I don't know about for the rest of the podcast. That 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 area kind of gets flipped out quite often. No, I'm sure. I'm yeah, kidding. Yeah, yeah. But no, spread spread the word. If you know somebody that wants to give them a try, you know, let them have them. And, and full disclosure, they're not paying me for this. So I just. You know, we got to talking and I realized that this is a, you know me when I make shows, I, I like problems that, I mean, I like solutions that fix a problem. And this fixes a huge problem for a lot of people. So that's and, what this is all about. And, and yeah, I, Chuck, we, we really appreciate it because that's, that's all we've been trying to do. I mean, you know, we're trying to make a buck here, but we're, we're you know, we started this mission trying to solve a problem and uh, it, we've, it's taken a long time to get us to where we are. Gary, Ron, I appreciate you guys coming on the show, and uh, we might have to have you guys on this show in the future. We would love to. We would love to. That is a time-saving device, and time is money. You should really look into it if you're doing that, that kind of access control and electrified openings. Till next time, knowledge is power. That's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.